Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over to Chronix with Raymond Neeson, who's going to talk today about on-chip variation. Raymond, what is on-chip variation? On-chip variation is all about the differences of the characteristics between different points of the same chip. How does that relate to process variation? Process variation is all about the differences between the characteristics of different dyes. So you have one die come from, comes from one wafer or a different part of the wafer or an entirely different wafer lot. So they're also going to be different from die to die. And that is what process variation is all about. Does it get worse as you move from node to node? So from 10 nanometer to 7 nanometer to 5 nanometer? Absolutely. So it's not a new phenomenon. It started, people start looking at it about 15 years ago. And at that time, it was not yet a first order effect. But with uh, more advanced technology nodes, the features becoming sm are becoming smaller and smaller. And the accuracy with which they can be printed is also now getting smaller and smaller. That's to say, there's going to be more variation uh, the way a particular feature gets printed on uh, silicon. So is it a function of the feature size? Is it a function of the thickness of the die itself? It's primarily the feature size. The thickness of the die is not as much of an impact on, on these effects, but the feature size itself, as the transistors are getting smaller, as the wires are getting smaller, uh, especially also the vias, they are uh, all becoming more and more different between uh, different die. Why don't you draw this out for us? Sure. I'll draw a timing path starting from a flop, ending on another flop, and the uh, clocks that show how the clocks are getting dis distributed between these two flops, plus a data path between these two flops. What are we looking at here? Here you see a schematic of a typical path between a launching flop and a capturing flop. The clock comes from a common starting point and gets distributed to the launching flop and the capturing flop. And then there's a data path from the launching flop to the capturing flop. Now, what you see here is buffers and muxes. Buffers, of course, are very well known. You're going to have that in any clock distribution topology. Having many muxes in such paths is fairly unique to FPGAs, where, of course, the muxes implement the routing flexibilities to implement a plethora of different clocking topologies as required by the user design that gets mapped to the FPJ post silicon. So what you see here is uh, I annotated the different parts of the path with uh, delays. Mm -hmm. These are nominal delays. This is uh, if all the si silicon were exactly the same, you would get exactly these delays, five nanoseconds here, four nanoseconds here, one nanosecond here for a data path, and another four nanosecond for this uh, chunk of the capturing clock path. On your diagram here, you have completely different numbers. How do you get around this? What's the solution? What you see here is these numbers is what you would get if all the silicon were exactly the same from die to die. The, you would get five nanoseconds exactly here. If it were ideal, you would get four nanoseconds exactly here, one nanosecond exactly here, four nanoseconds exactly there, and everything would be very easy to analyze that is to say, if there were no process variation from die to die and no on-chip variation within one die. And so what's the normal solution to this? Margining? Is that the typical way that we deal with this? Initially, when these phenomena got introduced, the uh, quickest solution was to add margins. It was not yet a first-order effect, so the amount of pessimism that was introduced by adding some small margins was fairly minimum and uh, you could still uh, close timing even without uh, having to worry about the size of those margins. But now at seven nanometers, if you add a lot of margin, you're basically wiping out your power budget, you're wiping out your performance improvements. That is correct. So if you were to simply apply the same margins or make increase those margins from technology node to technology node, the margins by now would have gotten so large that it simply wouldn't make sense to move on to the next energy node anymore. And the amount of pessimism that you then would be adding due to the simple-minded margining technique would become entirely dominant and you would not be able to close timing even on fairly simple timing paths. So what's the solution? So initially, 
people, like you said, uh, started applying margins. When that became clear that it was too pessimistic, people started applying uh, derating factors. So that is to say that they would go like, this five nanoseconds is really a distribution. It's a t statistical distribution around five nanoseconds. And I know that it's never going to be uh, more than uh, initially, let's say, 3% faster or 3% slower than that. So they started applying a, a derating factor on the 5 nanosecond. So it would be plus minus uh, 3%. And then, of course, here they would put plus minus uh, 3%, plus minus uh, 3%. And plus minus three uh, percent. Why plus minus? Because uh, if the path is the part of the path is used for setup analysis, the launching path needs to be derated in a positive way. That's to say, you need to add delays to it, and the uh, capturing side of the path needs to be derated as if it could be faster than the nominal four nanoseconds in this case. So that also flew for a little while. And then people start to realize that if you do the math on these numbers here, you actually realize that there's no way to close timing on this path uh, if this percentage increases any further. So if you go to more advanced technology nodes, this number, 3%, goes to 5%, 7%, 10%. So if you now imagine if this has become, instead of 3%, if this has become 10%, everywhere 10%. Now, if you do the math, you realize that this whole path can never close timing due to the pessimism alone in this model. Why is this pessimistic? It's pessimistic because, first of all, you have a part of the clock tree that is common between the launching clock path and the capturing clock path. Now, that same piece of logic was derated one moment with minus 10% and next moment plus 10%, but it's not gonna be both at the same time. It's not gonna be like one clock tick, the temperature is gonna be uh, very low on this path and in the next clock tick, the temperature on the same logic is suddenly gonna be at its maximum. So you know that that is a very pessimistic way to look at things and that's why people realized, hey, I have a common part of my clock tree and that part I don't need to uh, vary by plus or minus 10%. The common part of the clock tree, I'm just going to try to filter out entirely. I'm going to pretend that my clock tree, my clock path actually started at the divergence point. So that technique sounds fairly simple to explain, but in the timer and the delay calculation environments in the software, it's actually a, quite a bit of a headache to uh, get that right. And uh, so if you don't do it, you will not close timing on this path. If you do, then you realize that I, I'm almost there. I uh, just, just by calculating my delays more accurately in a less pessimistic fashion, I can do so much better and uh, by just doing away with that pessimism. That is uh, uh, applying these uh, derating factors globally. That's what's called global OCV, GOCV. One factor applied globally. Now, they do get applied differently to wires and to cells, and there's a few other uh, dis distinctions that are being made. This is uh, all well known in the uh, time analysis world. It's been known for uh, well over a decade. The technique to basically cancel out the pessimism on the common clock path is called CRPR. It's clock pessimism reduction. And that has also uh, already been applied for quite a few years now. Now, as I said before, in FPJs, you have all these clock muxes. The total delay through your clock network tends to be a lot larger than you would find on typical uh, ASICs, even if they are on the, of the same size. So as you can imagine, the amount of variation that you see in FPJs is going to be larger than in absolute terms compared to ASICs. And that is why it is extra important that a software flow for FPJs does take these uh, effects into account. Now, the um, next step is to say, well, maybe this is still very pessimistic. Maybe the, uh, the, the, this 10% has now become so large in current technology nodes that uh, I, again, need to take a closer look to refine this further. 
Where does that 10% number come from? It comes from the fact that delays through these gates will vary due to the on-chip variation effects. And the, uh, it consists of two components, really. One component is what's called a systemic component. The other one is a random component. Now, the random component can vary independently from stage to stage. The systemic component does not. So now, if you are assuming that the, in a path like this, every step of the way, it can be, the delay can degrade in an uncorrelated fashion, then that is a source of undue pessimism. So that is why the number 10% in of itself is too high, but you don't know what it really is unless you take, yet again, a more refined look at it. Are those 10% numbers that you have up there additive? Do, does 10% plus 10% plus 10%? It is, absolutely. So that will be uh, very, very pessimistic. And uh, in reality, the correlated component can be filtered out. It is, it's a form of, uh, to assume that a correlated uh, probability is actually uncorrelated is, it, is pessimistic. So if you now uh, take a closer look so you can take advantage of the fact that you're dealing with at least in part correlated uh, probabilities here, then you can uh, do what's called a depth-based OCV analysis. And that is to say that these, these gates here, they all are multi-stage gates. And you, of course you have different gates to begin with. And the depth of this path is now counted in terms of number of stages. And again, FPJs are unique in that sense, in the sense that you have tend to have many more stages in the clock path than with ASICs. So that makes it extra important that in FPJ design software, you model these effects. So at the first stage, you assume the maximum uncorrelated uh, probability of, let's say, 10% in this example. The next stage is not going to be also 10%. It's going to be less of this delay. And the next stage is going to be even less, even less, even less, even less. So at the end, you're not applying a full 10% derating over this part of the path, but it's going to be a fraction of that. And likewise, the data path is uh, analyzed in a similar fashion where you have all these routing muxes in the FPJ technology. Here you see a LUT, which again, in of itself is multiple stages. The routing muxes again here are multiple stages, and then you end on a uh, endpoint here. Likewise, on the capturing path, obviously, you have uh, lots and lots of stages that you now have to account. And then instead of derating one global factor uh, for all these stages independently, as if these probabilities are uncorrelated, you now model the fact that they are correlated, at least in part. And then the actual number that you come up with is going to be much less than this 10% as the path gets deeper. So in a very short path, it doesn't matter all that much. If you have one stage, that's, you're going to suffer 10% uh, at that on that path. But like I said, in FPJs, these paths tend to be a lot, lot deeper. And then in the end, uh, the total stage-based OCV calculation uh, gives you uh, something more uh, closer to maybe 5 or 6%, depending on the depth. And then if you do the math in this example, it turns out that uh, this uh, path can actually easily run at 750 megahertz. Whereas uh, all the way in the beginning, the path couldn't even run at uh, 300 megahertz. So if you don't model this effectively, what happens? Quite frankly, then there's not much point in going to the more advanced technology nodes. You would probably have to margin away so much or there's going to be so much pessimism that you're going to find that the performance that you achieve on those newer technology nodes is actually f worse than uh, on your previous technology nodes. On the contrary, if you do take these uh, effects into account and you model them accurately, you're going to get a better performance out of your future technology nodes. Raymond Neeson, thanks for a great explanation of a very complex problem. You're welcome. It's a pleasure.